just uh, uh, go ahead to, to move on. Um, I want to first review the uh, RNA sequencing part. So today is the third lecture. And uh, the first slides here, it shows you the RNA sequencing, the general pipeline. And this is the messenger RNA. And then the first step will do the RNA of cDNA fragmentation. Okay, it depends on where your reverse transcription happens. If you do the reverse transcription first, you will do the cDNA fragmentation. If you do the RNA fragment, uh, I mean, after the fragmentation, and uh, you probably, so, so the point here is uh, these sequencers so far only on working on the DNA. At a certain point, you have to change that to the, to the, from RNA to DNA. Although there are some technologies that are trying to work on the direct RNA sequencing, but not there yet. And next step after the fragmentation, you want to do the library preparation, and you can see the, the linkers there, and then you do the sequencing, and you got those ACGTs. And from there, you want to go for the alignment part, bioinformatics analysis. This will align the reads back into the genome or transcriptome. And you can see there's some reads that are called exonic reads, and that they align on the exon regions. There are junction reads, and there are polyadenylation reads. And then you can further do whatever other analysis that you, you need to do. And uh, traditionally, when we talk about the transcriptome analysis, uh, uh, the first thing that jumps into our mind is the gene expression. And uh, we know that uh, which gene expressed and by how much. That's important. But uh, RNA sequencing allows us to go to the transcriptome in a higher dimension. And the second one is the splicing patterns. So you can see there's a, a one gene has three isof, uh, exons, and in one condition, it, it can both all the three in the final product, in the, in the other condition, only the middle one is skipped. So even with the same gene, same expression level, you may end up with a different biological product. And the third dimension is the variation on the transcript. Even this gene has the same expression level, same splicing isoform, but because of the single nucleotide variation that can cause a, a further consequence, including the protein structure uh, uh, operation. Okay? So we'll get into this a little bit this lecture. And what we can do, get out of RNA sequencing experiment, this is a summary slide, so you can see that RNA sequencing can give us the gene expression and further figure out the differential expression, and uh, can do the alternative splicing, and can identify the transcriptal variation, including the non synomics variation, synomics variation, variations on the 3' UTR, or further allele-specific expression. And uh, the, for the synomics variation, it could disrupt the RNA binding, protein binding, therefore affect uh, alternative splicing. If the variation happens on the stream from UTR, which by the way, you can identify those variations in the RNA sequencing data, and uh, if they are microRNA binding sites, that will further affect the differential expression. And another advantage of RNA sequencing can give us the, the non-coding RNA profiling, which uh, sometimes hard to do on the arrays because we don't know too much about where those, uh, those non-coding RNAs are. I'm not going to go through this array principle anymore, but uh, the limitations of a microarray platform, the first one is uh, the high background level because of the cross hybridization. So we cannot really measure the low expression genes very well. And also because of the saturation, we cannot measure the high expression gene very well either. So the dynamic range of, uh, of microarray technology is much lower, and this is a limited dynamic range part. And uh, another limitation is uh, arrays rely on existing knowledge about the genes, genome sequence. Uh, we have to know there's a gene there to put it on the array. Sometimes uh, we don't know exactly uh, what we know and what we don't. So RNA sequencing doesn't have to have those type of prior knowledge in terms of human genome. And uh, this is uh, one um, um, from, from a paper that uh, uh, published in 2009, summarized the differences between arrays and uh, RNA sequencing. And uh, the point I put circle here, so you can see the background noise uh, for the RNA sequencing is lower, and, uh, and uh, um, so that you can, you can go through this, and the, the dynamic range are higher, and, uh, and things like that. So, so you, you feel free to, to go through those. Uh, for the experimental considerations, so when we prepare for the samples, this is not too much to do with the analysis part. So we talk about uh, the amount uh, of a total RNA that is required. Initially, it's a very large amount, which goes to 100 nanogram, uh, microgram, and, uh, but people has the protocol, you can even work on the single cell level. 
So the dynamic range of this part is pretty high as well. And uh, uh, based on GNAT, that our university, the, the system so far is uh, comfortable working with uh, maybe 500 nanograms yeah, of total RNA. That is uh, pretty good. And uh, we mentioned the importance of ribosome removal because 95% of uh, the total RNA are ribosome genes, and we don't need those. We don't need to know their expression levels. And uh, so there's a significant need to remove those. And otherwise, all our rays, 95% of our rays go through ribosome, which we don't want to see. The reverse transcription, there's uh, two ways to do that. Either use our legal DT or random primer. And uh, they both have their advantage and disadvantage. If you do the oligo DT and you get out, read of a ribosome RNA perfectly because ribosome doesn't have the poly A, and, uh, but uh, you are restricted kind of uh, on the genes that are polyadenylated. There's a lot of non-coding RNAs. They are not polyadenylated. So they, they will be missed. Another problem of using oligo DT is uh, the three prime end uh, bias because uh, uh, those RNAs will be degraded, and every single molecule measured has to have the 3' prime end to be able to reverse transcribe. So you will see much higher signal towards the end of the gene if you use oligo DT only. And uh, you can use random primer, but you have to go through those ribosome removal part. And uh, we also need to consider whether the assay itself maintains the strength of the RNA. Sometimes when you study non-coding RNAs, it's very important to have those maintained because we don't know the exact annotation of those non-coding RNAs. And other thing we need to consider is uh, the paired end, whether you want to use that or not. If uh, you believe gene fusion, for example, is uh, something that you want to discover, you really look, want to look at in your sample, probably paired end is a must. But sometimes for other type of applications, you may consider the balance between the whether we use the paired end or we want to save money. So by saving, by saying saving money, that you can run more samples using the same cost, and which also includes increase your statistical power. So those are the things that when you design the experiment, you have to explore a little bit. We went through several different published studies. The first one we went through is the mapping and the quantifying of a mammalian genome. This is kind of the first RNA sequencing paper that was ever there by the Barrow Woods group. And then we also mentioned how to use a paper to study the alternative splicing using RNA sequencing from Chris Birch's lab. The gene fusion is another study we mentioned, and the mRNA sequencing whole transcriptome analysis of single cell, and you can see that people can work on that level. And genome annotation for the non-mortal organism, because uh, for some of the, 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 the species, we don't have the reference genome, so we don't know too much about the reference genome, so you have to use RNA sequencing to annotate those. And uh, virus in the complex disease, and uh, those are, uh, is, that is another important application. So these are the things that we went through last time, and also the small RNA profiling, which we will get into hopefully uh, a little bit today regarding their data analysis part. After introducing those uh, applications, and uh, we started uh, to look for the analysis part. The first analysis uh, tool that we need to go through is uh, the alignment. And uh, we know that RNA sequencing alignment is different from DNA sequencing because all those short aligners, they do not allow big gaps, okay? And we know some of the RNA rates because we are sequencing the transcriptome and the, the, the junction rates, uh, if you align it back to the human genome, and you, wouldn't, you will miss those. So some of the people ask me after the class, so what's the percentage of rates that map to junction? Can we just ignore those? But think of... Uh, the, the length of the rays, let's say 50 base pair or 75 base pair, do we have an idea how long the axons are? Do we have an idea? Nobody? General statistics, give a guess. Let's say medium, medium value, what's the medium value for the nucleotide length of the axon? 1,000 base pair? 100 base pair? It's 127 base pair. And uh, if you based on that kind of statistic, of course, some are shorter, some are much longer. And uh, one third of the 50 base pair rates will be on the junctions. And as we are talking about today, that those junction rates are really, really important for you to study alternative splicing. And uh, 
So, so those are something that we have to have special consideration. So in terms of splicing uh, alignment, there's a two general approaches we talk about. The first one is called the axon first approach. So basically what you do is uh, you align those rays back to the genome so you can see those axon rays that has been aligned first. Forget about those uh, hybrid ones, which is the junction rays. And then you are further using different type of strategy to map the remaining rays back on the junctions that where your, your axon has been expressed. And the second type of which is uh, much less popular is uh, the seed extension approach. So first, uh, you separate those rays into smaller uh, windows and then for each individual window, you map them and join them back together. Okay? And uh, the most popular approach to do the RNA sequencing alignment is called the top hat. And uh, that is a, a typical axon first approach. Okay? And after the alignment, the first question, we still want to see the first dimension of this transcriptome, which is the gene expression. And we talked about it last time, which is uh, um, sometimes uh, to calculate the expression levels of the gene is uh, a tricky issue as well. The major thing is uh, because of the alternative splicing. And you can see that this is one gene and uh, there's uh, two different isoforms. So one isoform, you can see this axon is missing and uh, so the dark blue one. And another isoform and this one is there and uh, the, these two are missing. So there's alternative splicing there. So which rays you really need to use when you're trying to calculate the gene expression levels. The general approach are axon union or axon interception methods. So the axon union methods, we are using all the axons. The rays fall into all the axons. And uh, the good thing of this is, of course, you use more information. All the rays that fall into this region, this gene region, you're using it. And the problem of that is that it underestimates the expression of alternative splice genes. So this is uh, one typical figure. You can see that uh, this is uh, uh, the true RPKM, and uh, this is uh, the estimated RPKM by the dark blue is using the axon union approach. You can see that it's a consistently um, the under evaluating on their expression levels. And the second approach is to use the axon intersection approach, which why only focus on the consist con constitutive axons and uh, forget about alternative splice axons, only using the rays that to those rays to, to those axon regions. And the, the good thing of this is it gives an uh, unbiased evaluation of the gene expression, but the problem is uh, you are using much less information. For those reads, you don't get those, okay? But nevertheless, uh, for the RNA sequencing gene expression levels, keep in mind axon union approach and axon interception uh, methods. And after we get uh, through the gene expression levels, we want to calculate uh, uh, the uh, differentially, differential expression. So you get two two conditions, and what's the, which gene differentially expressed between two conditions. And uh, there are many methodologies that have been developed for array-based studies uh, using read coverage to quantify gene expression levels. Sometimes we can use those techniques, like heat test or things like that, it, as long as your sample size is bigger enough. Or we mentioned, briefly mentioned, the Fisher's exact test statistics, or t-test based on the generalized linear model identify the gene expression estimation. If you don't know what that is, go back to your notes to look at that. And uh, the model, the biological variability in the absence of a large number of biological replicates, so if, uh, if we don't have 30, 40 samples in each group, and at that time we have to go back to the original distributions of the data, and we know that gene expression levels for the microarray, roughly we think of after doing log transformation, it follows normal distribution. But for the uh, RNA sequencing data, it more focus, follows Poisson or negative binomial distribution. So how to use those distribution equations to help us to increase our statistical power. And uh, the last thing uh, we want to keep in mind, the factors affecting differential expression and uh, the, quantification state, uh, the quantification strategy really also affect the differential expression call. And uh, we had example in, in, the, in the lecture and uh, some of the, 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 the uh, genes, if we use the axon union approach, we don't see any differential expression. If we, see, we use the axon interception approach, we, we do see it. 
and the sequencing lens and library preparation, flow cell effects, and GC contents are, all those things are part of the game. So you need to consider those as well. Okay? Any questions so far? Perfect. There will be at least uh, two quiz questions out of those reviews. <laughs> Just some of the hint. Uh, we actually, we got a busy schedule today. We will talk about alternative splicing, gene fusion, or least specific expression, RNA editing, and small RNA sequencing. Okay? Uh, and uh, most of them are conceptual. Um, you, I, I need to, you to understand it, not really go back detail into the equations and which step is doing this uh, differential integral and things like that. Don't, don't worry about that. But I want you to have the general understanding of what is the biological information being used, what's the assumption of it. Okay, let's first talk about alternative splicing. And the number of genes in the multicellular organism, you probably see these slides before, and we know that in human gene, there's about 20,000 genes, human genome. And the last time we talk about in C. elegans, which is the worm, we have about 18,000 genes, okay? So there's only 1,500 genes that we are more than worms, okay? So the one of the joke I always give is uh, we have to find out some molecular mechanism to explain that we are better than the worms, okay? So in terms of the number of genes here, and they don't really distinguish too much. And uh, alternative splicing here is one mechanism that sits on top of genetic code and contributes to the biological complexity. And uh, alternative splicing is a process where one gene produces more than one type of mRNA. So you can see three exons, and after different conditions, and all the three exons in final product, and the only the middle one has been spliced out. And this can be tissue specific and condition specific. And those could have very serious uh, ph uh, phenotypical effects. And alternative splicing is an important level of gene regulation and major source of proteome diversity. And we know this deregulation, if they, they, they are not controlled well, and uh, we, will, we will be sick, there's a, a disease or especially cancer related. And we also know about 90% of human genes uh, express multiple isoforms. So this is not one gene or two gene issue. And it's estimation that over 60% of disease cause mutations disrupt uh, uh, splicing. So when we go to this uh, figure, you can see that uh, there's uh, many different types of uh, alternative splicing. Not always like uh, I plotted three axons and the middle one is missing. All right. There's uh, many different types. So the first type is uh, called the cassette exon, which is uh, the one that I plotted. The middle one can be missed or can be there. And the second type here is the alternative five prime splicing site. So you can see that uh, the three, when we talk about the, the directionality of the splicing, we always sit on the introns, okay? That's why this site is called the three prime end, and this is uh, called the five prime end, not on the exons, all right? So this is the alternative five prime splicing. So you can see in one condition, the splicing happens in this way and another in this way. And uh, alternatively, you can see the alternative three prime end uh, variation. And uh, there are other, also other types. This is a mutually exclusive axon, and this is intron retention. So the middle part can be completely spliced out, can be lived in the final product. And there's uh, also other two types of events that are um, also, you can consider it's alternative splicing events, alternative events, but they are not uh, happening on the splicing um, stage, which is an uh, uh, alternative promoter. So you can see that the start of the gene can be different, or alternative polyadenylation. That means their end is different. So the end results of all these events are you have one gene have multiple isoforms, but some of them, the top ones, are regulated in the RNA level, and uh, for this alternative promoter, is regulated in the DNA level. So that's the major difference. And uh, actually, there's uh, for different tissue types, there's also um, very different uh, uh, occurrence of all these events. So the estimation is uh, in human brain, has uh, brain and the liver, or the two organs, have the large amount of uh, uh, splicing isoforms, okay? And bone is uh, pretty bad. It, it most of it's 
not, not too many uh, isoforms. But for the liver and the brain, it's, uh, it's very active in isoforms. And the brain, the most isoform happens in the cassette exon phase, and for the liver, it's in the alternative five and three prime. So, so those are the things that it, it, it's good to know. And uh, the reason when we study alternative splicing, of course, is because of the splicing patterns. They are complicated. They, they can be, um, um, they, they, they can have phenotypic e e effects. Another thing is uh, there are something that is regulating this splicing. This including the RNA binding proteins, uh, RNA secondary structures, and other factors uh, so that cause this. And the one thing that you commonly see from uh, literature is uh, the, there are cis-acting RNA elements that is regulating the alternative splicing. And uh, the ones that act on the axon and in the introns. And some of them is uh, promoting the splicing. Others are inhibiting the splicing. That's why you see this ISE, ESE, or ESS, ISS. Those stands for axonic or intronic splicing enhancer or silencers. The point here is uh, there are RNA binding proteins uh, binds in somewhere in the, the precursor micro mRNA and then regulates the splicing. Before we have the RNA sequencing technology, and there are some technologies that we can use to genome-wide identify the uh, splicing patterns. The first one is the axon array, especially asymmetric axon array. So we know that traditionally, when we talk about microarray technologies, we use the probe to target each individual gene. So this probe targets gene number one, this probe targets gene number two. Okay? We are using gene as a unit. Okay? But for the axon array, instead of using the entire gene as a unit, they are using each individual axon as a unit. So that by the end of the day, you can see this is the FA matrix array design. For each axon, they design uh, up to four probes to target each axon. Therefore, you not only get the entire gene expression levels, but also each individual axon expression levels. And this is one of the examples you can see the middle axon. This is one gene, multiple axons. In one condition, it's low across the board. And in another condition, it's pretty high, but it's low for this particular axon. That is really suggesting that there's alternative splicing occurred. Okay? And after the axon array technology, and the, uh, the axon array technology is perfect when you think about that, but when you really do the experiment using it, and uh, we are pretty miserable. Yeah, I was uh, very much miserable. <laughs> and there are some better technologies and to increase the sensitivity of splicing detection. One of the things is also array-based technology. It's called splicing junction arrays. So instead of targeting different axons, uh, they are targeting different splicing events. Okay? For example, this one is called the axon uh, intron retention, right? So for one isoform, it's a, there's a, this is a, the axon, an intron will be spliced out, and another one, this is a not a, a, a spliced. So what you do is you design probes to target all different locations here. So most importantly, you got one probe to target on these junctions. And if you see the difference that, that between the, the, the probes signal supporting the splicing or supporting the inclusion, and then you will know that which part the splicing happens. The point here is uh, splicing junction arrays, you are designed the probes to target on the splicing junctions that help you to identify alternative splicing. And it turns out that this technology has much, much higher sensitivity. However, in order to design these arrays, we have to know the species in terms of ter potential alternative splicing pattern really, really well. Okay? You are not guessing there's an axon here. You know there's an axon here. You know there's a splicing could occur there. That's, that's the only way that you can uh, design the probes to target on that. Specific sensitivity, I mean, the, the, the data will look very, very good for the ones that you're targeting. But you are potentially missing a lot of other things. OK? Does that make sense? OK. All right, now let's go through the RNA sequencing technology. And using next generation starter and splicing, again, this is a simple uh, scenario. So you can see there's a many different rays here. And uh, all different rays, after you do the proper alignment, 
there are some rays, like the black rays here, okay? Those are called constitutive axon rays, constitutive rays. That means those rays really locate on the constitutive part, and it, it doesn't change across both two different isoforms. And there are some rays, which is a red ray. They support the inclusion of this event. Think a moment. So this axon is an in or out. If it's in, and those red rays will be um, identified. And if it's out, the green rays will be identified. So you can see that one end on this axon, the other end on this axon, and the middle one has been spliced out. Okay? So there's a three types of rays, axon inclusion, axon exclusion, and constitutive axons. And these are the most important information that we need to use to identify the alternative splicing. And uh, we have seen this example before. So this, uh, this is in a real life example. There's a axon, there's so many axons here, and then there's the introns. And the, this, uh, this particular ray is supporting that this axon will be included, and this ray supporting this axon will be included, and this rate supporting that this axon will be excluded because uh, the bar, the, these two axons, they, they join together. And this will tell us uh, that there are multiple isoforms in this particular gene in the sample. Okay? So now let's go to the uh, analysis part. The computational strategies for that is, uh, the first one is uh, called isoform-based approach. So what that really means is, uh, and this is uh, the RNA sequencing data, expression levels, you see the rays and things like that. And this is uh, two different isoforms. The problem here is uh, the isoform information is invisible for you at the moment. You only see the, the distribution of those sequencing rays. You don't really know the isoform at this stage, right? And then what's your goal to do this uh, RNA sequencing is uh, trying to see to reconstruct those isoforms. That's, that's one of the goals. And so it's called the isoform-based approach. For this particular example, you can think of, uh, mm, probably the, this isoform has about 20% in, in the final product, and 80% uh, is uh, this isoform, because the middle one, the expression level, is much, much lower. And uh, if you're smart, you can figure this out, right? However, once we got multiple isoforms on one gene, it's pretty difficult. You have to have strategies. Sometimes it's very rare, it's very common that one gene has 10 different isoforms, and at least potential isoforms, and how you can reconstruct that, that requires some computation. And uh, uh, in terms of isoform-based approach, there's uh, two general, uh, smaller categories. The first one is called the genome-guided reconstruction and uh, we will spend most of the time to talk about two uh, tools. One is the conflicts and the other is the scripture. And uh, the second one is the genome independent reconstruction. So basically what you do here is you first do the assembly and then do the uh, isoform reconstruction. So we'll get to there. But both these two general categories are isoform based approach. And there's another way to look at this problem is uh, from the event. So as I mentioned, if you have multiple isoforms here, and you have problem to reconstruct those isoforms, but if you're sitting on this alternative splicing event, you're sitting on this event, you are facing only two choices. It's included or excluded, okay? Everything else doesn't matter. You're sitting here, look at this particular event. So you can use the individual alternative splicing event as your unit. And then for this particular example, you probably think, oh, 20% of uh, that, the, the, the transcripts uh, contains this axon, 80% doesn't, right? So once we, we, if we have only two isoforms, no big deal, okay, they are the same. But if we have, think about if we have 10 isoforms, okay, and the isoform-based approach is very difficult. But for the splicing event approach, is I'm still having that or not having that. And uh, my final evaluation which will be what the percentage of final transcript had this, okay? 
So there's the two general approaches in terms of in terms of alternative splicing. So let's go through the first one is the genome guided reconstruction, and there's a two very, very important tools. Okay? If you study RNA sequencing data using technology, this is something that everyone needs to know, the, especially the first one, the couplings. So let's, let's go through that. Just the basic principle, no mathematical equations for this. Uh, the first step is uh, you need to do the alignment. And uh, you have to choose a, a, a liner that is capable of producing spliced alignments. And top hat will be a good choice, right? We spent a lot of time last lecture talk about the, the strategies to do the RNA sequencing alignment. We have to pick the right one, okay? So you can do the top hat and you do the alignment. You can see that there are some of the reads and uh, I mean, this is uh, the pair end. So basically, you sequence both two pairs, two ends of a, a, a transcript. And, uh, and, the, and the, for one connection, if you're sitting from the back, you probably won't see it, but look at your nodes. And, uh, and if it's a solid line connected, that means that that is one fragment and you have two ends sequenced. And for this one, that you can see that this is a solid part, actually. This is uh, uh, the one that was not sequenced. But this is a dash line, and this part is uh, the, the, the junction part. So one read is across the junction. And you will see this is a splice fragments alignment. And, uh, and uh, so this is uh, after alignment, you will see this. The next step you, you want to do is uh, to identify a minimum set of incompatible fragments that must have originally from different splice mRNA isoforms. And, uh, for this data, this schematic example is uh, these three reads, there is it, no way they are from the same mRNA isoform. Okay? Let's think of why. For these two, okay, you can see that uh, for this one and the middle axon is included for sure. And uh, this one, the middle axon has been excluded. So these two rays, it's not going to be from the same isoform. That makes sense? All right? So because of the difference here, all right? And uh, this race is not going to be compatible with either of this because uh, c clearly that this in, in this isoform, this part expressed, and for this part expressed, but uh, in this isoform, so they were both spliced out. Okay? And this is a minimum set of incompatible fragments. They are not compatible. You can find another set of incompatible ones. Or this is the minimum set. So, for example, this one, this one, and this one is not going to be compatible to each other as well. Fine, if that's, a, that's your choice. Yes? I have a question. So, what's the solid and the dotted line mean? Solid is, so this is a pair end. Okay, look at me down there. This is the paired end. So, you've got RNA fragments, you're sequencing both two ends. All right, the middle one is not sequenced but they are kind of connected. The dash line here is uh, for this one end, all right, it's across the junction, all right? So after they are connected in the RNA level, but once you map it back to the DNA level, they are separated because there is a junction occurred there. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So, the second step is very critical. Identify a minimum set of incompatible fragments from different isoforms. Yeah. A maximum set of incompatible fragments. And you're lower, low, lowering the, the specificity then. So we'll get into that. The, 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 so the question is, uh, if we use this part, and we probably will identify something real, but uh, we're, we are also running into the risk to missing something. Okay? We will miss some, because they probably they are not really, uh, it, it, we say that these two are compatible. It, it may also from two different isoforms. So who knows, right? And, uh, so we are in the risk of, of missing something. And we'll talk about next approach is, uh, is fixing that part, but in the, in the uh, other uh, part we don't like as well. Yeah. Right. 
any any one is fine. So th that's what I said. If you are choosing this race, this race, and this race, that is okay. Okay, that is okay. So we'll, we'll look at the next step. So this is a minimum incompatible race. And next ta next stage is uh, trying to make a graph connecting the dots. So here is you can see that all those reads, okay, and I put the middle one and I define this as a node. So each fragment corresponding to a node here. And the edge will be the connecting two different fragments. I only connect them if they are compatible to each other and their alignments overlap. So let's see what that really means. For example, this is a fragment, this is a fragment, and I'm connecting those together because uh, they are compatible with each other and they, they can occur on the same uh, isoform. And also, they, they are overlapping. The same thing happened here. So this one and this one, they are compatible with each other and they have some overlapping. But I'm not going to connect the yellow one with the blue one because they are not connecting to each other, because they are, they are not compatible with each other. And I'm not going to connect this one with this one, although they can be on the same isoform, but they are not overlapping. Okay? So the first stage is to identify a minimum set of incompatible fragments, and the next stage is uh, to make this a graphic and uh, to connect the individual dots, individual fragments. That makes sense? Need some more time? Yeah. Oh, oh I guess in, for example, in machine learning or other, um, this, but usually it's, it's claimed that uh, this minimum set serves as an um, initial starting point. Mm -hmm. So different initial starting points may lead to different. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. I, I guess for this particular example, you may. So, so the question is so for machine learning, if you, you start from different uh, initial parameters and uh, you start one initial parameter, so you're converging to one set of results. You start from another set of parameters, you may converge to that result, maybe converge to something else. Whether the final product is uh, sensitive to your initial choice of this alignment, I don't know. I have no answer for that. And uh, you may try more complicated approach, I mean data sets and to, to, to give a test. I have no idea about that. All right? So it's okay I say no, right? Because I really don't know. Um, next step is so to construct the path. So you can see that there are different, uh, so we, we already connected the dots and then you just uh, uh, conceptually constructed and uh, to merge those. Those are one path, this is another path, and third path. Okay? And, uh, and then using this minimum path cover and to get to the transcripts. So you can see there's a three potential transcript isoforms. The first one representing the yellow one, which is, uh, which, which is uh, the one that this part is spliced out. And for the blue one, so you can see there's a, a small left over in here and then there's a potential axon in this region. But for the purple one, it's most likely to be um, not right side all. All right? Is that all right? Okay. So the overlapping graph can be minimally covered by three paths, and which is uh, these three colors. And the next step you are doing is uh, for these uh, three different isoforms, you want to estimate their transcript abundance for each different isoforms. So you can see those the colors is labeled there and together with uh, which potential isoforms uh, uh, they, are, they can belong to. So clearly for the yellow part, and uh, this one is the yellow one, right? And uh, for the, if the blue one, this is the blue one, and the purple one, so all the rays, all the rays that support this uh, red one, uh, a purple one, it's labeled as, uh, as this uh, same color. And there's one thing that you cannot see very clear. It's this one, this rate. Is that right? Let me see, yes. This rate, so this is, a, keep in mind, this is a paired end. This is a paired end, okay. And for this particular rate, it can be from 
either this isoform or this isoform. So you can see their color is labeled a little differently. Okay? And for all these rays, these rays, they can be from all the three different isoforms, so they are labeled as uh, black. Okay? So well, what you want to do at this stage is uh, you map those individual rays to see which individual isoforms it's compatible with. And then together with the fragment length, uh, when you do the RNA sequencing experiment, because you know that both two ends, how long the middle uh, RNA fragments is, there will be a range of that. And then running that through the, these uh, equations, which I can tell you some of the parameters are being used here. Let's forget about the equations. Rather focus on what's the information in the equation. The first one is uh, this row. This row is actually the one you want to identify. It is abundance of uh, different uh, transcripts. Those are our parameters. And this is a Bayesian type of approach, so you're trying to calculate the likelihood of the row given all the read information. And another information being used here is the length of the transcripts, and there will be a distribution of the length of uh, that, that uh, RNA fragment. Okay? So this, this information will be used together, and eventually you just solve this complex equation and uh, lead to this uh, maximum likelihood uh, abundance estimation, which you can see that the, the purple one expressed this much, and together with the blue one and the, and the yellow one. All confused? Go back to look at the notes after <laughs> the class. So the summary slides for the coupling says it, it requires the splice alignment, such as the top hat, and uh, it's capable of identifying and quantifying isoforms from RNA sequencing data. Okay. Not only identify the isoforms, but quantify it. And it can be used uh, both on the single end and pair end. And there's a concept that here is uh, uh, for the pair end, it's called the FPKM, not RPKM. Okay. RPKM stands for reads per kilobase uh, axon model per million mass for rays. But here, because of its pair end, and it's, it's, it's kind of F, FPKM. It's called fragments per uh, K per M. And uh, there are some following algorithms for the cufflinks. It's called the cuff diff, and it can help you to identify the differential expression of two different isoforms in two different conditions. Okay? Are we okay with the cufflinks? So conceptually, what I have said is uh, you first uh, do the alignment and then identify a minimum set of incompatible rays, and then build the graphic. That's the trick. Okay. As Yang Yang mentioned, we may miss something. There may be some isoforms. So we ha it's, it's beyond these three isoforms. But these three isoforms are a minimum set. Okay. And uh, and it's all open source uh, software and. Uh, I don't think we'll go through another homework, but uh, you can try if you like. All right. And the second uh, tool that I'm going to give is uh, called a scripture. And this is uh, it's kind of interesting. Is uh, They publish in the same issue of Nature Biotechnology with the Cufflinks, just a back-to-back -back paper. And this is, uh, so Cufflinks is uh, it's developing in Caltech, and, uh, and this uh, scripture is, is from MIT. And the first step is very similar. It's alignment, and this is, is the same as, as, as couplings. You also need to pick the alignment that's capable of producing spliced isoforms, okay, as a top hat or things like that. So you can see that uh, the figures is uh, if there's, you will see some of the rays here, and there are some junction rays that are connecting these two parts or things like that. And uh, your second uh, step will diverge a little bit. This is kind of very straightforward, okay? This is uh, nothing, no equation, just a strategy. At this stage, they only use the spliced rays, okay? They only use the spliced rays. This is the part I hate, okay? Because we know it's hard to really um, do the splicing, the, 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 the junction alignment is so hard. And sometimes we are missing things there. But at this stage, they only rely on those rays. Okay. So what, what happens is, uh, and they will, uh, only based on supply rates, uh, they will make the directions determined using supply set sequence features, A, G, G, T. So you can see they will make this separation. There's one 
axon here, one axon here, and this, there, if there is a stress rate supporting this, they will connect this to two. And if you can see this is a conceptual axon here, and if there's one rays that across this part, they will connect this too. So they will connect based on the splice rays. And uh, it's a very strong requirement for the alignment quality, which is really, really difficult. And next step is uh, they will construct a connectivity graph of individual base, still only based on the splice rays. So nothing special, they just make a circles instead of this, uh, this straight line. I don't know what, why they, they make it an extra step for that. Uh, but there is uh, something special is uh, you see the, there are directionalities here. So for this one, it's from, a, from another gene which is connecting, happens to be the same connecting together, and they are in a different color. So that's what they did. And next step is start to make sense is uh, to, they will score each individual path. So you can see those passes, and they will score each individual path. What they do here is uh, they will use both splice and unsplice rays. And uh, if they have enough enrichment here, and they will connect this. So they will, for each individual path, they will calculate the p-value based on the abundance of uh, splice and unsplice rays. And if the number is small, like 0 0.01, they will have cutoff, and, uh, and that is more likely to be a real. For this one, it's 0 0.5. It will not be in the next stage. Uh, connection. So you can see that those are the ones, that, and this is 0 0.8, it has been ruled out. So they, they just uh, be considered as noise. And next step here is uh, they will identify the number of graphs in this, uh, in this figure. And you can see there's a one graph here, and there's a one graph here, and there's a one graph here. They identified three graphs with uh, uh, schematic figures, and this score significant path rather than axons increase the sensitivity. And the last step is uh, they will join these graphs. So you can see that this is a, it's a couple of separate graphs. This is one graph, this is another graph, another graph, another graph. But, but they want to join that using the pair and the rays information. So if it's, they, they see there's, a, there, there's a one ray that covered this, uh, this both two ends, they will join the, 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 the graphic together. And what they do here is the alternative splice alpha form identified by considering all the possible passes. And uh, Yang Yang, you will like this. So they are using the, all the pos possible paths in the transcript graph. So you, hopefully you are not missing anything. And eliminating alpha forms that result in pair and reads map to a distance with low likelihood. So if, uh, if there's an alpha form making, if you look at the one pair and the, one fragment and two, ends are too far away from each other, it's unlikely to be the case, and, the, and the, that will lower the probability that they're joining together. But anyways, they will evaluate those. And uh, a summary for the scripture is it's also highly rely on reads across splicing junctions, and it's very strong requirement for the alignment, and uh, longer reads contain, uh, will certainly help. So for this this part. You, you need a longer arrays, otherwise it's really hard to get through. So major goal here is, is for the transcriptome construction, not quantification. That is a difference, one of the major difference between scripture and the couplings. The couplings can do both the isoform reconstruction together with the quantification. For the scripture, you only do the reconstruction part. It doesn't do the quantification. And it's great for study regions without anno any annotation if you do the alignment correctly. And it requires pair end to discover isoforms. Okay, so everything I talk about uh, couplings, uh, scripture, I know that you have some idea, but you are not really having any idea how to do it at this stage. And uh, I hope I encourage you to go back to look at that. And, uh, and it's not that difficult. And uh, if, if, if no enough information is provided in the, in the, in the um, uh, slides, go back to the papers to, to look at those. But this is the one slide I want you to keep. Um, there's no quiz on this slide, by the way. But, but this is the one slide I really, really want you to get the, uh, get the information on. What's the difference between the couplings and the scripture? Okay. Uh, they have a commonality. The first commonality is that they both are genome-guided reconstruction. So you have to do the alignment first and then reconstruct it. And both heavily 
relies on splice alignment. So you have to be very, very careful at the stage of doing alignment. You want to pick the one that is the best. Okay? It, it doesn't have to be the fastest. It has to be the best. Because the, 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 the end result is so much relying on this uh, uh, the, uh, alignment quality. The major difference. Cufflinks is a minimum path cover. So minimizing, maximizing, what is maximizing is the specificity. Okay? Meaning that if I see it, it's there. If I see it, it's correct. Scripture is considering all possible paths in the transcript graph. It's maximizing the sensitivity. Okay? If it's there, I have a higher probability to see it. But what I see is not necessarily correct. So you always want to find out the balance. It really depends on what kind of a biological application you are doing and uh, how, how much money you have for validation. <laughs> if you, you want to only validate a few, you probably want to pick a couple links because uh, every single thing you see is potentially real, but you're missing things. Here, you have a lower probability to miss things, but not everything you see are real. This is the information I want to deliver in this message. That's the comparison, in my view, of the couplings and the scripture. Okay? And uh, are we okay? Let's take a five minutes break. <laughs>